For almost 12 years now, I've watched TNA, and I feel like I have a very love-hate relationship with the company. Sometimes I love them, and sometimes I hate them. However, more often than not, it seems like I love to hate them. And I feel that's in large part due to what TNA has chosen to do over the years. They frankly have done a lot of dumb, stupid shit. And as a result, they deserve to get me to love to hate them. Now in 2014, it has felt like TNA has finally learned from the error of their ways and finally has learned from their repeated, repeated, repeated past mistakes and has decided to focus on doing things a different way, focus on new stars, focus on them in a new way. And it has been very refreshing. But make no mistake about it. Where I talk about the WWE doing WWE things the WWE way, whether you like it or not, TNA also has their same type of wrestling bubble, if you will. They love to do TNA things the TNA way, no matter how much logic tries to smack them across the face and say, no, that's dumb, don't do it. No matter how much the fans of TNA beg for a different path and beg for something different, this company seems to be irreversibly stuck on stupid. And make no mistake about it, TNA is a poorly run operation. Make no mistake about it, this company is Bush League. Make no mistake about it, that is an incredible accomplishment considering they have major national primetime cable television on Spike TV. You want to know why they are a second-rate Bush League wrestling operation here in the United States? May I present to you TNA Lockdown 2014, wherein you have the chance to really prevent present a counterculture to the WWE, a company that is doing a lot to piss off a lot of fans right now. Mind you, a lot of those hardcore serious fans that make up a very large portion of the TNA wrestling fan base. TNA decides, hey, we love WWE so much, we're going to try and imitate and try to outdo them. We're going to sit there and take that fan displeasure to a whole different level here in Dixieland. And by God, they may have very well just succeeded with TNA Lockdown 2014. I would say it was shitty, but I don't even know if using the word shitty does the level of suck of this pay-per-view justice. You want a sign that TNA as a company is irreversibly stuck on stupid? Try this on for size. Instead of lining up your UK tour schedule with your lockdown schedule, and actually having your lockdown pay-per-view in the UK where you know you are guaranteed to draw a decent gate, have a nice size crowd, and really have that show come across very well on television to your pay-per-view viewing audiences at home. Instead, you choose to, instead of do that, you choose to not only bring your pay-per-view stateside, but you bring it to a shitty, shitty sports town like Miami. Oh, the 900 people that were there at Coral Gables tonight were all excited about this. Let's get rid of this myth once and for all. Yes, it is the home of the U, but there were a lot of years that even when the U was reigning supreme, they might have run the city of Miami, but they didn't always necessarily run people into the damn Orange Bowl to watch them play. This is a horrible sports city. They have a bad history in terms of attendance for wrestling events. Why any wrestling company still chooses to run pay-per-view events there, I have no freaking idea. Because you are destined not to sell it out, no matter what size the venue. And TNA said, no, no, no. Why have it in front of 5,000 or 10,000 people in the UK? We can have it in front of 900 people in Miami. Mmm. You want another sign that this company is irreversibly stuck on stupid? Well, try this on for size. You bring in Wrestle One with absolutely no marketing or no promotion. Imagine that, TNA. One of your actual remaining pay-per-views that you're expecting people to pay a pay-per-view price to, to a pay-per-view provider, whereas the WWE is doing their pay-per-views basically for 10 bucks a month on the WWE Network, you are so intelligent in your ways that you decide to bring in people from Wrestle One who a lot of your fans have never fucking heard of, 
And all the while, you decide to not market or promote them so that way anybody could actually have a fucking clue who they are. You have a, one of these three guys is a freaking X Division champ and nobody even fucking knows it. And then on top of that, when Great Muda comes out for this six-man tag, you sit there and have a crowd that does almost nothing. A legend like the Great Muda, somebody that a lot of hardcore wrestling fans and a lot of older wrestling fans know who the fuck he is. How dare you not market and promote his appearance? But it figures. This match was kind of eh. It was an okay opener, but nothing great. They barely utilized the cage. And of course, TNA would put over the stars from another wrestling promotion. Now you're going to sit there and say, well, Sonata or whatever the fuck his name is, he's the X Division champ, and apparently he's there to stay. Doesn't matter. They still ultimately put over another wrestling promotion's talent over their guys, just like the TNA business model for almost the past 12 years now, right? And the hits just keep on rolling. Another sign that TNA is irreversibly stuck on stupid after the six-man tag, they decide to trot out Dixie Carter for a promo that at best deserved to be buried in the middle of the go-home show of impact. My fucking God. Any chance you had at the crowd being excited quickly left all 900 of those people, and they probably wish they would have left during this promo. What a gas bag of anti-charismatic suck Dixie Carter is. Holy shitballs. Oh, my insurance policy. Oh, Jeff Hardy. Oh, shut up. Who gives a fuck? Get this heifer off the damn stage. Get her out of this goddamn pay-per-view. Who thought this was a good idea? She sucked more life out of this pay-per-view in her five, six minutes of talking than the blue board does in one of my reviews. And by God, that's saying something. <laughs> the irreversibly stuck on stupid TNA Express continue to roll along here at Lockdown 2014. Escape the cage match, Samuel Shaw versus Mr. Anderson. Oh, goody. Even before the match, you knew you were destined for a certain type of suck here and stupidity here when Samuel Shaw climbs the top of the cage and basically implies that he's going to commit suicide. Now, if you're Mr. Anderson, you would think, frankly, you would just let him do it, but no, 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 no. Mr. Anderson comes, does his talkies, and then we have a freaking match. Now leave it to TNA and their stupid asses to have a ref bump in a cage match where the ref is outside of the fucking cage. Only TNA would think that this is a good idea. So of course Anderson climbs over, his feet land on the ground, of course he should win. Maybe another ref comes out, maybe the timekeeper sees it, match is over. But no, in TNA logic land, this shit continues. Samuel Shaw drags Christy Hemi through the hole because for some damn reason Christy Hemi had to come out to watch this match up close in person to begin with. Knowing that if there was a chance that Samuel Shaw escaped and won the match, he would come after her. Oh, Samuel Shaw wins. This sucked any remaining life completely out of the crowd. This was awkward. This was bad. This was terrible. And most importantly of all, for truth, justice, and the TNA way, this was stupid. Of course, one of the biggest examples of TNA being irreversibly stuck on stupid is the fact that for so many years, anytime they've maybe had a fresh face, somebody that they could actually build up and make into a star, they just completely forget about them and or bury them to get over a former WWE, ECW, or WCW guy. So Ethan Carter III's not going to wrestle Kurt Angle here. So he comes out to cut a promo, of course, because that's what you need on this fucking pay-per-view is another fucking promo. This is supposed to be a pay-per-view. You're supposed to be counterculture to the WWE. Stop trying to out WWE the WWE, you stupid fucks. But no, TNA is just so irreversibly stuck on stupid, they just can't help themselves, can they? So Ethan Carter III tries his best to be epic and awesome, and he issues what sounded like to me an open challenge to have Bobby fucking Lashley come out, whoop him around a little bit, and then that's it. No match, and then it's all about Bobby Lashley at the end. Wow. TNA just can't help themselves. 
anything they could do. It's like they intentionally try to build up a young guy just to have a WWE, WCW, ECW guy come in, steal their spot, and steamroll right the fuck over them. Get the fuck out of here. What a stupid-ass company. And they wonder why they only got 900 people to one of their three biggest shows of the damn year. Morons. So at this point in time in the show, TNA desperately needs anything at all to inject some life into this damn show and to inject some life into the damn crowd. Enter the freaking spot monkeys, Manic and Tigre Uno. Whoopee! Now, of course, it just wouldn't be TNA if they didn't do TNA things the TNA way. You have Manic randomly fucking appear on a pay-per-view after barely being on TV the past several months because, again, you're irreversibly stuck on stupid to face a guy that none of the TNA audience really, frankly, knows who the hell this guy is. So they try to go out there and kick, and they try to go out there and flip, and they try to high-spot it, high-spot it, no-sell it, high-spot it to try and get the damn crowd involved. Imagine that. I expected to tune in to watch a TNA pay-per-view, and I'm watching an ROH fucking suck fest. At least I'll say this. Tigre Uno was impressive with that fucking 450 saber tooth splash, whatever he called that finisher. I almost wish he would have just done that at the very beginning, maybe off the top of the fucking cage and ended this match. Fuck Manic and fuck TNA for sitting there and doing this type of stupid shit. Heading into this pay-per-view, I thought the last man standing match between Gunner and James Storm had a chance to be the match of the night. And it lived up to those expectations. To me, this ended up being the match of the night. I was really a big fan of the way, in particular, this match started. This had a really hot start. You know, why wait till you get in the cage? Why go through all the formalities and bullshit? James Storm hates Gunner. Gunner hates James Storm. Let's start scrapping right fucking away and do it for a couple of minutes. An outstanding, high-tempo, fast-paced start to this match and this pay-per-view desperately needed and it perfectly fit this match but of course with TNA being again irreversibly stuck on stupid you knew eventually they were going to find a way to screw the pooch on this one and I feel that they exactly did because you're talking about a last man standing match here this is the feud that has the most story heading into it and the most personal hatred heading into it and you have no fucking color, no blood. Now, you had a match later on in the night that some people will say, well, that's why they didn't have it, and it was okay that they had it there. No, this is a last man standing match. This was supposed to be different than the other cage matches. As a result, it had more story. It was more hatred, more heat between the two of them. It should have resulted in something different, meaning fucking blood. If you are attempting to sit there and try and establish yourself as being different from WWE and counterculture to the WWE, then if you're going to choose one match to do that, you do it versus with Gunner and James Storm in this last man standing match. This is ridiculous. If I want to see a last man standing match in a cage with no blood, I'll watch the WW fucking E, not TNA. Why would you give me the same type of shit that I could see on the WWE? And all the while, the WWE one at least will be in front of a bigger audience and it'll be much more well produced than the TNA crap. And all these years later, it seems like TNA is still irre irreversibly, excuse me, stuck on stupid when it comes to booking out the finishes of their matches to where it comes across very well. How often do you see a damn TNA match that has so much going into it, and then it ultimately falls flat on its face at the end and leaves you upset, disappointed, and not amused? And that's exactly what happened here. If they were going to do this type of lame shit at the end, they might as well just had it been both of them get count on and let the feud fucking continue. I mean, when Gun or one, it was like you barely won. It's like, yay, where it should have been like a great fucking hoorah. I don't know who the agent is that structures this match backstage. I don't know who decides on these finishes, and I don't care. But the bottom line is, it's just yet another example of how irreversibly stuck on stupid TNA is, because even when they have a match like this that has so much going for it, they find a way to underwhelm and disappoint with it. The Knockouts title match was my poop break for this pay-per-view because the last thing I wanted to see again was the overrated botch fest and Gail Kim take on the overpushed low talent goat face in Madison fucking rain. You want to know how, when you know a company is irreversibly stuck on stupid? It is when they take something that is one of their signature things about their product, one of the things that people actually tune in to watch their Knockouts division and make you completely not give a fuck about it.
That's a damn shame, and yet another sign of how irreversibly stuck on stupid TNA truly is. TNA has done a ton over the past few years to piss off a lot of their former loyalist sheep fanboy TNA fans. They truly have. And here at TNA Lockdown 2014, the company had presented themselves with the perfect opportunity where the WWE has pissed off a lot of these type of fans with how they treated CM Punk and CM Punk leaving the company and what they're doing with Daniel Bryan, what they've done with Dolph Ziggler and da 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 And a lot of fans in general being very upset, or at least the internet ones that vocalize their dissent and dislike for the WWE product very loudly and boisterously, they've got those fans very, very upset. Now you take somebody like a Samoa Joe, who has a name from ROH, that a lot of people that don't watch TNA anymore actually liked Samoa Joe and actually watched the product in part because of Samoa Joe and he was at one point in time their favorite or one of their favorites. Here's a chance here to rectify a lot of previous wrong. Maybe, maybe extend a freaking olive branch here to some of your disillusioned, disenfranchised former TNA fans and bring them back in the fold and throw them a freaking bone here when they're sure as hell not getting that from the WWE. Now look, I understand you've got a young, impressive heel champion in Magnus, and you know what? In theory, I could understand why you would put him over. But leave it to TNA to have a Joe Rules freaking stipulation to this match and find a fucking way to have Samoa Joe not win the title. And of all fucking things, this match was actually doing all right to me. I thought this was maybe Magnus's best title match. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm saying that. Now, I find it very funny that TNA can't go with Samoa Joe as a freaking world champion for them. Why? Because he wears a freaking t-shirt? Well, what if he sat there and painted his face, he was in his 50s, and he used to be a top guy for WCW? Would it be okay then if he was your world champion since he wore a t-shirt? Sure. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. That just applies to Sting. Those are Sting rules, baby. Ah, oh, get the fuck out of here. Of all ways to have this stupid fucking match end, instead of sitting there and maybe having Magnus actually get a signature victory over a Samoa Joe, or maybe having both of them get knocked the fuck out, and neither one of them can answer the bell, and finding that way to extend the feud, which would have maybe not let people be 100% happy, but it wouldn't have pissed him the fuck off and left him feeling like, what the fuck's going on here? You have freaking... a Abyss of all people, abyss, pushing the same fucking people in the same stupid ass way with the same stupid shit. You got abyss freaking reaching his arms through the ring to get Samoa Joe, and then Samoa Joe reemerges only to get hit with damn Janice by abyss. Now, of course, he hit him with all the fucking nails, so there's no marks in his shirt, you know, and there's no blood pouring out at all, but TNA will never bother to address that. They decide now, apparently, that after abyss has been gone for just a couple of weeks, it's time to bring him back, and you've aligned him with Magnus, and apparently Magnus is the one that's made him right. And now he's going to be Magnus's protector. Magnus is still the TNA world champion. Oh, and it gets better. Afterwards, EY tries to go after Abyss and Magnus. Oh, is this setting up to an EY title shot against Magnus? <laughs> you want to talk about irreversibly stuck on stupid. Here was a chance to sit there and give your fans a moment. And TNA just couldn't do that. They couldn't sit there and say, you know what, we'll give the belt, even for a week or two, to Samoa Joe. No, we can't do that. We got to sit there and do this dumb ass shit that reeks of a certain Russo variety. Where you got a guy coming out through the ring and then he's hitting him with Janice, but there's no real consequences. And oh, it's all types of crazy crash TV garbage bullshit. This match would have been better if it was inside of an electrified cage. So that way all of the remaining 900 people there at Coral Gables could have sat there and ran into the damn cage and pretended that they were electrocuted so that way they'd be wheeled out of the arena and they wouldn't have to watch this fucking train wreck cesspool. As soon as they announced that this wasn't going to be the main event, I said, you know what? This company is irreversibly stuck on stupid because here's an opportunity with a title match that has some history behind it. These characters have a reason to have beef and animosity, and they have a lot of history together. And it's two guys that aren't former WCW and ECW and WWF slash WWE guys. Everything points to this match should be the fucking main event.
So, of course, it was, and I said, oh, Joe's not winning, and something stupid's going to fucking happen. And sure enough, at least TNA decided to do TNA things the TNA way, and they didn't disappoint me there. They fully lived up to the expectation, these stupid sons of bitches. And they wonder why so many people have tuned out their product the past few years. And they wonder why they can't even get a thousand people to show up to one of their damn three biggest pay-per-views of the year. You want to know why, Dave Lagana? You want to know why Dixie Carter and Al Snow and everybody involved with the company? It's because of bull fucking shit like this. Ooh, another stupid push for abyss. With so many signs of TNA being irreversibly stuck on stupid throughout this entire pay-per-view, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, and come main event time, I wonder how they're going to manage to top themselves. It wasn't a question of if, it was how and by how much. And boy, did they ever. Leave it to TNA. Instead of focusing on Magnus versus Samoa Joe for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship as your main event, because after all, that's your world title. No, instead, let's focus on a fucking power struggle storyline and make that the main event. <laughs> In the lethal lockdown match. <laughs> oh, my God. Where do I even begin? Oh, let's begin here. That was some great hometown pop for MVP, wasn't it? <laughs> Again, Miami sports fans suck. I think even Miami sports fans will tell you that. Most other people around the country can clearly understand that Miami, excuse me, is not a good sports city. So when these wrestling shows go to Miami and expect to get great reactions from the crowd, it's not going to happen. Especially when you only have less than a thousand people there. And by this time, it even looked like some of the people that were sitting close to the front had already left too. And who could fucking blame them? Oh my Christ. So let me get this straight. Instead of focusing on your world title, you decide you're going to focus on a power struggle involving Dixie Carter. Because that's what's best for business. And then, of course, you know, instead of making somebody like a Bobby Roode the center point of this match, or an Austin Aries the center point of this match, or your new hot tag team, the American Wolves, the center point of this match, you decide to focus on freaking Jeff Hardy returning as Willow, because that's going to put a lot of asses in the seats, right? Oh, Lynn, did you hear the reaction when he was on the top of the cage when his music hit? It went over like a fart in church. And then he proceeded to go... Head over tea kettle, right into square in the mat, right in between four people. What an impact that made. As Vince and Gorilla Monsoon used to say, what a maneuver. Oh, my Christ. But then, of course, oh, no, 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 no. That's not enough. We've already got MVP in the match. So, again, we're focusing on former WWE talents. Now you throw Jeff Hardy into the match. Oh, but it gets better. Dixie's insurance policy from New York was none other than Bully Ray. Oh, 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 buddy. So now you're killing two birds with one stone. Not only is he a former WWE star, but he's a former ECW star too, damn it. Oh, that makes it twice as good and twice as impactful. You know, this stupid fucking company here. After all these years of doing all this shit, this is the type of shit you would expect if a Vince Russo was booking the show. Is he? This is the type of shit you would expect if Jeff Jarrett was the featured guy. Well, he's not there anymore. He's not involved with the company. So what's the excuse? It is 2014. It is time to stop pushing these guys that aren't drawing asses to seats. It is time to stop with the insanity. It is stop time, excuse me, to stop with this course of being irreversibly stuck on stupid. If you think Jeff Hardy is some great fucking draw, you had announced beforehand that he was going to be there at lockdown in Miami, then why were there less than a thousand fucking people at one of your three biggest pay-per-views of the year? This was your main event match. This is what you chose to make the featured attraction. Yet another fucking power struggle storyline, you stupid sons of bitches. And then, of course, you get to the great finish. The same guy that just a few weeks ago was talking about pile-driving wives and children and was sitting there and doing all this creepy crap, talking about how he was going to kill Mr. Anderson, has now apparently come to the good side. He's seen the light out of Hell's Kitchen, miraculously. The oven light is flashing in his fucking face, and oh my god. He turned on Bobby Roode. He turned on Dixie Carter. And at the end of the day, MVP pins Bobby Roode, and Bully Ray is the great fucking conquering hero. 
You know, as Taz kept sitting there and talking about the ultimate double cross, the ultimate double cross, it was almost like it was code, like he was trying to tell us that Vince Russo was back. And by watching this show, by God, I would believe it. While this show isn't necessarily like, let's say, a Victory Road 2009 bad, it sure as hell wasn't any damn good. And when Taz sat there at the end of the night, and actually the commentary was one of the things that wasn't all that bad about this show, he hit the nail on the fucking head at the end of this when he said what Bully Ray did was the exclamation point on this show. No shit, Sherlock. I couldn't have said it better myself. What a drizzling pile of shit where the TNA crew had a chance to do something positive and to make themselves stand out as being different from the freaking WWE. They just, yet again, found themselves irreversibly stuck on stupid and tried to do WWE things in a half-ass way. You have less than a thousand people show up to your damn event one of your big three pay-per-views now, that's embarrassing. You are actually charging people full pay-per-view prices for this garbage. That is embarrassing. And it is now in 2014 that you are still pushing free people like freaking MVP and Jeff Hardy and Bully Ray over somebody like a goddamn Samoa Joe. If you were going to have somebody from Team MVP win this damn match, couldn't it at least been one of the damn American Wolves? Oh, Christ. It's the same old shit, just a different day. Same old, same old song and dance. Ridiculous. I'm this close to giving up on TNA, and I truly mean that. If you don't think I mean that, remember that I used to watch ROH and I used to watch SmackDown. And I don't watch them anymore. When I say I'm that close, I'm that fucking close. And if TNA finds a way to manage to actually push me away from this product once and for all, then shame on them, because I have an incredibly high threshold for stupidity. But even I have to admit, when it gets to a certain point, it just becomes too fucking much. And this show to me was a perfect example of TNA stupidity just being too fucking much for me to handle. They actually charge people full pay-per-view prices for this shit. And they wonder why so many people fucking stream their pay-per-views. Well, ding-dong, dumb dicks. When you give them crap like this, it's no major surprise. And it shouldn't be to you either.